welcome back to Ticklish Business, the podcast devoted to honoring and deconstructing classic cinema. As you can tell, this is Kim again, and we are joined by Kristen today. Kristen, how are you? May the force be with you. Yes, yes, yes. So as you can gather by that, we are tackling what's going to be a fun discussion, I'm sure. We are discussing Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. The first one, take your pick, whichever term you want to use. And we are joined by a special guest today. We have joining us to talk about this landmark groundbreaking science fiction film, writer slash blogger, Chris Mitch. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to talk about this. I'm so honored to be on this podcast. I can't wait to talk about Star Wars. Good, good, good. I'm really excited. Kristen's letting us have this conversation because I kind of fought for this one a little bit. We're all in the classic film circles. I'm sure people out there are going, oh goodness, why are you guys talking about this one? But I think this is definitely a worthy inclusion. So this is surprisingly celebrating its 45th anniversary this year, which doesn't feel like it really should even be the case. I think I remember the 20th re-release in theaters. So this, where is the time going? Ironically, it's the 25th anniversary of the special edition of Star Wars. Oh, no, no, no. Don't say that. <laughs> I know. But it's what's so crazy about it is like in the classic film sense, anything that's 25 years, like that's fair game. That's fair game to call it a classic. And the fact that the special edition has reached that status is interesting. And I can see that we're going to have some some interesting conversation regarding that edition. <laughs> based oh. On your oh, no, that's probably the one I think. Of. I remember going to see that in theaters. That was an elementary school birthday party for me. That was Star Wars. I mean, let's start with an easy question for everybody. What's your history with Star Wars? That can be a complicated topic or it's a long, it's a nostalgic thing for some of us. I know for me, it's one of those movies I remember seeing before I even, you know, was really thinking about film. Formative years were the early 90s. And I remember back to a VHS tape that my parents had recorded. And it was the first VHS recorder that we had. And it had, you know, Blockbuster, all the commercials. And it was the edition before all the editions. So this was as raw as it probably could get. And it was just something I always watched and I knew I had a Star Wars birthday parties. I, you know, went to see the special editions. So this is definitely a nostalgic favorite of mine that's always been in my life. It's one of those first films that I remember watching. So I have nothing but love for it. So I'm going to jump in and give my background with Star Wars because you are right. You fought for this episode. This is not a movie I would have picked. Even though we've talked about how there is a differing number that changes every couple of years with regards to what is considered classic, Star Wars is definitely in that time period. But I remember telling you when we rewatched this last night, I do not have the warm fuzzies for this movie that a lot of people do. I saw this very late in my developing film world. I saw this in film class in high school as an example of Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey and how it follows the three-act structure that we now know is seminal for storytelling. So I'd seen it in an academic context and then at, as a critic you just encounter it regularly throughout your life and I've, so I've seen this several times. It's a film that exists. I don't have the background with it of big memories. I love Carrie Fisher. I think everybody does really good work and will deconstruct the legacy because I think a lo- there's a huge legacy, both good and bad with this movie. But yeah, it, it was really interesting to hear you talk about what a presence this was in your life. And for me, it was always a niche thing. You know, it's up there with like Star Trek. Oh, it's sci-fi. And that's a question I think we could really deconstruct. Is Star Wars a sci- science fiction film? Because I feel like certain people get very defensive when you compare Star Wars and Star Trek. Like those are two very different things. I see them both as sci-fi movies because they take place in space. But there's a deep well of emotion for people who say like, no, Star Wars is not a sci-fi film. Yeah, you just described like half my life. Like it's like those... (laughs) Those conversations, people trying to pick a fight with me saying Star Trek's better or whatever. So yeah, we'll get to that in a second. I hear you loud and clear. The thing about Star Wars is most people that know me within my circles, whether it's in writing or work or school or have family, whatever, 
like I'm the Star Wars guy in that group, right? I'm the I'm the I'm that Star Wars guy. So they'll, hey, I heard there's a new movie coming out, like you know, and, and those types of things. The funny thing is the random questions you get. Like if the stormtroopers were clones, how come you know? And they go through all this. Like I have George Lucas in my back pocket that I can just pull out and answer that question. But it's really interesting in that I came to Star Wars a little late for my generation. I was the original trilogy generation, and I had actually tried to avoid avoid Star Wars. When Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back were popular, it just wasn't something that was grabbing me. I don't know if it was my age or whatnot, but when opening day, when Return of the Jedi came out, the cool kids in class ask this nerd, hey, do you want to go to the movies and see the new Star Wars movie? And to be asked by them to do anything was cool. So I went and we saw this movie and that was a very, not being with cool kids in the theater, but watching that film unspool, by the time you got to the climactic end battle, I realized oh, I have to be part of this world somehow, some way. Like I got to get involved in film. I got to learn how they made this. I got to understand how this came to be. Since that movie, I've seen every Star Wars movie on opening day. Like that was, and that includes special editions and the sequels and the whole bit. And that's how I got into Star Wars. I wanted to do exactly what we're about to do here. I wanted to rip it apart. I wanted to understand why it worked. And when I slowly began to unearth oh my gosh, Lucas borrowed this from Wizard of Oz and this from the Dam Busters and this from uh, Seven Samurai. I'm like, well, what are these films about? Wait a minute, what? And then that's how I became a classic film fan. I became a classic film fan through Star Wars. So fast forward a couple decades when you're meeting other classic film fans, whether it's in an online group or we're doing TCM big screen events and I'm talking to people there and the dramatic range of emotions about this film because in 2022 the fandom itself for star wars is extremely divisive if you go on twitter i I always say like twitter is basically a dumpster fire when it comes to star wars fandom but it seems really odd and i was shocked when tcm was going to show it as part of the film fest i was shocked when they aired it on the network i was fortunate enough to be a guest programmer on tcm and I talked a little bit about my blog, Digging Star Wars, with Ben Mankiewicz. And I had not heard the Ben Mankiewicz story about how much he hated Star Wars back in 1977. So it was kind of interesting. It was like passing gas in, in an elevator really loud. It was just kind of like, hey, I want to talk about Star Wars. And, and you just saw Ben Mankiewicz just go, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's very, it's very interesting how this epic film, this film that really not solely reinvented the industry, but came at a time, you know, mm-hmm. when the industry was being reinvented is like a dividing line, but at its core, it's a, a love letter to everything we love about classic cinema. Before we get into it, here's a short little ad for our Patreon. If you are a fan of old Hollywood, classic entertainment, and the joy of pop culture history in all its forms, please subscribe to our Patreon page like these wonderful people, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Jacob Haller, MCF, and Rachel Kramarchuk. Our Patreon is located at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. A special reminder, if we can get up to 100 subscribers, we're looking forward to posting a deep dive into an infamous movie in ticklish business circles. Does love truly mean never having to say you're sorry? Well, if we can get to our goal, you'll hear all of our opinions on love story. Trust me, there's a lot of them. Now, back to the show. You're right on, Chris, with talking about what a seminal film this is and we've talked about this a couple times with certain films where you you just wish you could have been a fly on that wall to see this at this time because this was two years after Jaws right when which reinvented the blockbuster and created the summertime season that we now know up until the pandemic was very reliable and before that movies tended to start in the big cities for a couple weeks And then would slowly bleed out to the smaller towns. So you'd see a new movie probably six months after it it had already premiered everywhere else. But with Jaws, it upended that concept and movies started to mass saturate opening day. You could see a movie anywhere because it would just be pervasive. And there's a reason Spielberg and Lucas are positioned together, not just because they would eventually work together, but because... They really did craft this moment in time of stories that, and I don't say simplistic in the sense to say that Star Wars is dumb or in its storytelling, but it's a very simple story, you know, Mm -hmm. of boy goes on a mission, you know, and boy meets girl, boy meets hero, boy saves the world. And to have a movie about a killer shark terrorizing small town and this space opera coming out so close together and really reinventing A, what a movie could be and B, what 
audiences were willing to stand in line for hours on end to see. I can't fathom it because I was not there to experience it because by the time I was born, this was just how it was. But to know that this is the film that created that, that's pretty intense to think back on that history. Yeah, it's funny too. Like timing's everything. That movie came out at the right time. I'm not saying anything that a lot of Star Wars fans have already, you know, haven't heard already in documentaries and TV specials and whatever. The films of the 70s up until that point were pretty dark, pretty heavy, pretty serious. The country was still reeling from Watergate and Nam, and, and there was a lot going on. And, you know, Star Wars wasn't Lucas's first science fiction film. THX 1138 was. And really a brilliant movie but a movie that was just like white noise in what the seventies was, you know, the bleak future. That was pretty much what people walked away with when, you know, the few people that saw THX 1138 in its initial run was like, cool, but like, my gosh, depressing. The legend has it that like Coppola challenged him. Hey, why don't you make a movie that makes people happy? And Lucas went and made American graffiti. And that changed cinema. That changed the way people were looking at, at it. This kid that they said, this kid's someone to watch proved he was someone to watch. And then he goes from that to Star Wars. And I think by the time you get to Star Wars, you get to Jaws, like you pointed out, you get to Close Encounters. People are like, give us a little bit of hope, please, because we're like dealing with a lot right now. It's no wonder that the initial Star Wars, once it was retitled Episode 4, New Hope, that's what it is. Like Star Wars is hope. That's the reason it struck a chord. And it worked against the grain. And pretty much everything about that movie should have failed. It didn't have a disco soundtrack. It doesn't take place on Earth. It's not dark. You know, yeah, you have Alec Guinness, you got a heavy hitter actor in there, but like, you know, you had a lot of new up and coming people. You didn't like, it should not have worked, but it did because of the timing and what people just needed at the time. One thing that strikes me too, I mean, I think, and you started to mention it earlier, the roots that we have here with nostalgia and with classic film. I mean, you mentioned the Dam Busters, you mentioned Wizard of Oz. I've been learning myself. I've been catching up really on my 70s intake really over the last couple of years and one thing that we don't i at least i have not really read about before the nostalgia in so many of those new hollywood filmmakers throughout the 1970s this was the generation that came up in classic hollywood they were shaped by classic hollywood and they pulled those so much of their influences like you said before lucas did american graffiti you know we have at the same time we have coppola who was well versed in that nostalgia bogdanovich of course these filmmakers all had such a love for classic film and this was what shaped them as people these were the joe dante uses you know it's touch later but he's so 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 rooted in all of that and they have such love and they were the kids sitting in the movie theaters watching these. And to me, it's all over Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, he wanted to do Buck Rogers. He actually went and you know, researched getting the rights to do a 70s version of Buck Rogers and it didn't work out to our benefit, right? Like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll make something else. He poured so much of himself into it and he was really lucky to have a lot of talented people around him at various stages of that production because Tunisia, the shoot in Tunisia wasn't easy. In the original edit, the whole concept of the Death Star bearing down on the rebel base was not in the original edit. You know, it was his wife at the time, Marsha Lucas, saying like, there needs to be some more suspense here. So he just had really talented people around him. Of course, Williams. Lucas's mood music was like the planet suite. And Williams was like, hold on. <laughs> you know, like, I think, I think I can do something better. And then when he crafts this film and he shows his friends like De Palma and Spielberg and John Milius and all that, like everyone but Spielberg laughed at him. They're like, what are you freaking doing? This is terrible. Now, granted, he didn't have all the effects finished. You know, he still had the World War II footage cut in for the TIE fighter dog, you know, X-wing dog fights and all that. Even the scroll itself at the beginning of the film, it it didn't have the effect. It was nonsensical. The palm was like, you've got to do something with this. They said, give up on this. And it was Spielberg that said, you're all wrong. And Lucas will have the last laugh here. And I love that part of the story because I'm a Spielberg fan as well. No surprise. But like, you know, that friendship that was born out of Spielberg seeing the short THX 1138 Electronic Labyrinth, seeing that at a film, that was born, that was where their friendship was born, at a film festival where Spielberg wasn't intimidated by Lucas. He was blown away and said, I want to become friends with that guy. So it's pretty amazing. Well, I know that your blog looks at classic film influences in Star Wars. I want to talk a little bit about that because for me watching this, 
on its own, you know? And it's hard to watch this movie without knowing where the other films go from here. Mm -hmm. And I think that that immediately was what struck me watching this first movie. Kim and I were joking about, you know, the relationship between Luke and Leia and how cute and like flirtatious it kind of is. And then you find out later that they're brother and sister. And so that is really hard for me to divorce in knowing that, you know, Lucas didn't plan that, you know, it wasn't necessarily planned to be a trilogy right away and that that came later. But I was looking for classic film influences and the Wizard of Oz elements are, are really key in the sense of Luke, Mark Hamill. I don't feel like I don't need to explain the plot to people because most people should know the plot to Star Wars, but <laughs> I'll throw it in as we talk about this. Luke going on this journey from being this farm boy and then going to the Emerald City in a way to mm -hmm. stop the Wicked Witch, which is Darth Vader. But I think some of just the other influences, you know, I know that Lucas has talked about, yeah, it's old serials, like when they're in the compactor scene and they have to get out. That was very much almost like watching an Errol Flynn totally. type of Adventures of Robin Hood. But I'm curious to hear you talk about some of the influences that may, I don't know. Is there one that flies under the radar for you that people would be surprised, like, is included there? Wow, that's a really great question because I feel like my blog, Digging Star Wars, it's in its 11th or 12th year. When I sat down to do that blog, I called it the Lucas Foil. I made a list of all the films that I thought, whether I've read about in interviews, I knew off the top of my head, whatever, that had some piece in the original trilogy mainly. I was trying to focus first on that before I went into the prequels and the sequels. And I wrote 247 films in one sitting. And it's just because there's just so much. Now, now, granted, some of it's to just like a line of dialogue or a feeling, you know, versus a major plot point. So I already mentioned The Dam Busters. Like, that's just such a great movie. And there's so many ties. And my blog had gone through evolution where I used to do sort of like faux podcasts where I would do like an audio session and drop it on YouTube. And it would be on my blog. And then I went through like a, a visual stage where I was doing poster to poster. These two films are like, and now I'm more text driven. But the Down Busters episode is, a, is one of my favorites that I did on the blog because not only is the final act of Star Wars basically the Down Busters movie, you have an aircraft that has to fly at a certain level at a certain space to be mathematically distanced from its target and drop its bomb at a certain point in order to destroy the big monstrosity that the bad guys need to succeed. I mean, like, it is that. I always felt that R2-D2 was Luke's way of calculating the love bug and making that into a droid that he can have in this movie. The coloring's the same. He's a little guy. He's always spunky. He doesn't listen to the people around him. He mouths off. He talks in beeps. Lucas was a car freak. Half of his student films were about racing or cars. So I don't think it's that far-fetched to say that's him incorporating that. And of course, Disney owning Star Wars like comes full circle. So it's like, yeah, of course he would add that in there. I have a guest writer now, it's on the blog, and, and I said, hey, listen, I want you to do the searchers, but I want you to save that for May, okay? That's really important. And he's like, okay, I get it, you know? And I was like, yeah, because like that's going to be our crown jewel this season is the searchers. I can't believe I've, I've 11 years and I haven't included that movie in there. It's John Ford's Fort Apache has moments in A New Hope, as well as she wore a yellow ribbon. I feel like I'm grasping at straws here, but there's just so much. And I, absolutely with The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz in, in a couple of different degrees, again, farm kid with off into a magical city. But also the compatriots that Luke has, just like Dorothy has. I'm one of those people that, like you mentioned, that you've kind of struggled with Star Wars, Kristen. I've kind of struggled with Wizard of Oz through my life. Like I got tired of people telling me I had to like this movie. Whenever someone tells you you have to like a movie, you know what you're going to do. You're not going to like it or you're not going to watch it. And you couldn't avoid the Wizard of Oz. It's, it's almost like mold. Like you just like you just couldn't get away from it no matter what you tried to do. But I finally came to terms with like, yeah, it's a great movie, obviously, and clearly influential on Lucas and Star Wars. I do think that both this and Wizard of Oz have a similar problem for me and that I spend way too much time trying to figure out the economic impacts of both of them. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz, I do not understand how they thrive. What is their core export? What do they make? How do they craft a financial system? And the same goes for Star Wars. Like I want to know how each planet is making money because Jedi seem like they're overworked and underpaid. I don't know. Well, it, it's funny because like that's been the problem with each of the trilogies, right? So like the original trilogy is just to your point, it's, it's a space fantasy, right? It's a space Western. It's a war story. It's, it's, it's not pure science fiction, right? And then we got to the prequels and I'm an original trilogy fan that likes the prequels. We're very rare. 
right? So, you know, I really like the prequels because I had my own kids that I could take to at that time. I like the inventiveness. I like that he just kind of turned 90 degrees. But a lot of original trilogy fans didn't care for them at the time and still are having a hard time accepting them, right? Then they started putting out like TV series and whatever. And then you go to the sequels. And those same fans that were complaining about the politics and the, the quote unquote boring stuff of the prequels were like, hey, I don't understand how this new first, how the first order works in the sequels. I'm like, that's the exact thing you just complained about with the last three films. Like, like sit, now you want the politics? Like, I don't, I don't get this. So it's just kind of funny how the, the, you know, the benefit of this 45 year old franchise with so many ways of telling stories these days has gone everywhere. I gotta say, it's weird being a Star Wars fan because I'm gonna sound very old man, cranky old man, but when I was a kid, you know, but, but when I was a kid, you had to wait three years for a movie, right? If you belonged to the fan club, you had to wait each month for a paper newsletter to be shipped to you, right? You know, not every kid was the kid that had every toy. So like I had certain toys, but my neighbor had the Death Star toy. There was all these things you had to wait for, right? Now you don't have to wait for anything. I can stream the whole season if I want, you know, like that type of thing. It's interesting how fandom has come because growing up, to your point, you were either Star Trek or Star Wars. Either way, you were the dork in the corner. Like you were like, okay, don't, don't, please don't mention Star Wars around Chris because he won't shut up, right? He won't stop talking. Right. But then there came a time where in social media, I was seeing people that I went to school with bragging, like taking my son to see episode three. And I would laugh. And my wife would say, like, why is that funny? I was like, that was a kid that beat me up for liking Star Wars when I was a kid. That was a kid that stole my lunch money. Right. Now he's a Star Wars fan and he's going off. And it's because of the mass acceptance of it. Like, like to your point, you don't even need to see the movie to know the story. Oh, Darth Vader's the bad guy. He's the good guy. There's robots. So people kind of can get the gist of it because of the simplicity of the original story. But the fandom has become really complicated. And it's complicated when you have multiple generations who are hating on other generations within the same fan base. And the irony of ironies, but my epiphany was, oh my gosh, we've become sports fans. Because sports fans love to bitch about their team. I can't believe they traded that guy. And now we got this guy and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what do you? what are you doing? Like, it's a movie. It's, it's supposed to be fun. Like you don't have to love it, but it's funny how fired up people get about it. it re- it's, it's hysterical. You bring up a great point, which is similar to classic film too. You know, I think of the gap between Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, which was several years, right? Mm-hmm. And in the 1930s, there was no home video market. So if you saw Frankenstein, the first film, you just had to remember everything that happened in the years between seeing that and the sequel. And it really didn't matter about continuity at that point because nobody was going to be able, unless you had a theater that was going to show Frankenstein beforehand, you weren't necessarily going to remember much more other than there's a monster, read the book. That would be the response. (laughs) And with something like A New Hope, it still took five years between the release of the movie in theaters in 77 and the VHS and Betamax, in case people need to remember that, in 1982. So the saturation structure of filmmaking, you know, release and distribution at that time only helped, I'm assuming, keep the movie in the public's eye. And even then, I think it was still, what, two years after that release on home video for the, the first sequel to come out. It's really intriguing to look at how fandom also has to do with distribution as well, because, I mean, I don't know any Bride of Frankenstein fans who lived in the 1930s, but I doubt that there was going to be much pushback if the movie was not how they remembered it. Whereas with Star Wars, like, oh, there's only talk about how the movie's not how they remember it, mostly because Lucas keeps tinkering with the finished product even now. But I think that home video also had to play a hand in kind of creating the sense of fandom. Yeah. And people, they remember what they remember. They they don't remember everything. Star Wars comes out in 77. Empire Strikes Back comes out in 1980. Jedi comes out in 83. Star Wars comes out as re-released in 81. And when that's re-released in 81, according to StarWars.com, that's when they added episode four to the scroll. But everyone, including myself, swears we saw it in theater or on HBO when it was that was a big deal when it came on HBO and up and down and I remember getting into a very heated argument with Charles Hildebrandt who's the son of the Hildebrandt brothers who painted the iconic poster of 
Luke holding up his lightsaber, bearing his chest, and Leia with her sexy leg out and on the, on the hill, right? The Hildebrand brothers, they made that iconic image. And I was in a, a deconstructing Star Wars panel with him at the Museum of Science Fiction Conference. And he was like, no, dude, look it up. Like that did not happen till 81. And he was right. And it really spoke to what you think of as a fan, and especially when you attach yourself to a movie. You know, you were mentioning like your parents' VHS. The special edition broke it. But for the longest time when I would watch Star Wars, I knew when every network commercial break would be, even if I was watching the blockbuster videotape. Like, oh, there goes the Jawa Sandcrawler down the hill. They're going to break for commercial. Okay, they're going to come back. All right, they're going to go off to Moss Island. Okay, they're going to break. That was a tape I watched. I watched it taped off TV. I knew where the breaks were. And you just ingrained it. So it's interesting, like, how people misremember things, but it becomes part of it. It's like, I don't know how many times James Earl Jones says, the line is not, Luke, I am your father. It's, no, I am your father. And people would argue with James Earl Jones. Who in their right mind would want to argue with James Earl Jones? He's James Earl Jones for crying out loud, you know? But people remember things a certain way, and that's what they latch on to when it comes to films. Well, it's the staying power of this franchise and how many different waves we've seen. I mean, just sitting here at this on this Zoom, we have three different, you know, memories of this franchise. You know, we were talking about the special editions. I mean, that I remember before the special editions, but I remember going to see Star Wars when that was re-released in theaters for that special edition. And that was a freaking event. Krista and I were talking about that last night, how it was special. It was rare. It was, you know, you've never, I've, I've never been able to see Star Wars on the big screen before. And there were lines and that was truly an epic experience. And now you turn on Disney Plus and there's TV shows of every single different era. And we've got all the eras milked out. And I was saying to Kristen last night, if I had a time machine, that would have been one of the places I would go to see that film before it was permeated in popular culture. It's something like The Exorcist. It's just so there now. It's so ingrained. It's, you don't even have to, you know, we didn't really even have to get the synopsis because the assumption is most people know what this is about. And that legacy has morphed so much. And it's just, this is such an interesting discussion. I want to go back to what you were talking about with something like the Westerns. You mentioned the Searchers and She Wore Yellow Ribbon. And I think that going back to what people remember, I mean, I'm not at all a Star Wars super fan or invested in the fandom, but I know that one of the big controversies is who shot first. And I think that in watching this movie on Disney Plus, you know, Lucas has made that He's, he's made on that shot how first, he wants it darn to it. be. Yes. <laughs> and it goes back to something we've talked about on this podcast many a time, which is the concept of reframing history within context. And it's mm. really fascinating that there's probably more generations now who have seen Star Wars A New Hope and have seen Greedo shooting first than probably mm. saw Han Solo shooting first. Mm. But it goes to your point about Westerns, which I'm really intrigued by, which is Westerns from the its inception to up until the 1970s, you know, with the end of John Wayne, the concept of having a character like Ethan in The Searchers, who does horrible offensive things throughout the movie, but it's John Wayne. Audiences still embrace that character because it's John Wayne. And with Star Wars, it has nothing to do with Disney. It has everything to do with Lucas. There's this idea in his head even though he's honoring Westerns, it's the concept that nobody will support Han Solo if he shoots this character first. And thus it has become canon. It's just really fascinating, especially within the context of us looking at how we always say, you know, you have to look at films in context. The concept of stuff like racism and misogyny, those are all indicative of their time. Mm -hmm. But Lucas kind of said like, yeah, but if you can change that, why not? And I don't know if he's right or wrong. I don't know who's right or wrong, but I find that to be probably the most interesting connection to classic film within A New Hope. There's two things like that I want to say based on that note is that Lucas, when he made Star Wars, you know, again, it, there was a lot, it was a very challenging project to complete. And so much has been said about what it's done the blockbuster lines and whatnot, but just for educational purposes, I feel like I have to mention, like he really embraced Kurosawa's idea of immaculate reality. 
he really wanted this world to be scraped up, dent it, dirty, and you could relate. And what that did, especially for kids of that era, was it made that world even more real, right? Because their parents' car might not be the shiniest, brand newest car on the block. But if they were climbing into this huge old clunker of a car, they could relate to our heroes, heroes rambling in the Falcon and it looking the way it looks. You know, in rewatching this um, last night, I've seen this film probably 122 times. Okay. Now it's like, okay, what's the new thing I'm going to see? I got to see something new. Right. And there is a great moment when they go into the docking bay and Luke says, what a piece of junk when he sees the Falcon. And Han starts explaining himself like, yeah, it doesn't look like much, but you got it where it counts and does all that. I glued myself to Alec Guinness in that scene. Oh my gosh. Like it was the biggest laugh I've had watching a Star Wars movie in a long time because he does the classiest eye roll that there ever was because he's Alec Guinness. Like he, like as Harrison Ford's delivering that line, he, you just see him like roll his eyes and look, but in rolling his eyes, he's also taking in the ship. I mean, that's freaking brilliant, right? It's those little details that we miss because again, we're, we're flying through the movie so fast. So anyway, I wanted to talk about that immaculate, that reality. And then the other thing as far as like, you know, like you're saying with like the context and stuff like it, it is important to realize I think the film industry needed this movie and they got it, you know, because like the box office was down at the time this came out, like, like not down, but like, you know, like it was sloping up because of Jaws. But it, it had a long, long run of like the industry wondering, like, what's going to happen, you know, and then this thing comes out and pretty much kicks open the door for like the return to like, yeah, it's cool to go to the movies again. It's cool to watch movies in the theater again. I, know, I just think that's really cool. A story aside, I just I just think like. That's kind of cool that that happened. And, and I'm kind of, I wasn't old enough to appreciate it back then. But like looking back as someone who's interested in film history, I think it's just, like I said, really, really awesome. I love how we've talked about this movie for, X, you know, X amount of time. And we haven't even touched on the actors and who became just as successful in their own right and have remained so. I mean, they all became stars. And I think it's great that Harrison Ford became a star, not just for, something like this where he is kind of the dashing Errol Flynn-esque figure but then doing something like Indiana Jones which also has a lot of classic film connections oh, yeah. in its own right but I think watching this again this go around I could see far more classic film connections in their performances so Harrison Ford I saw a lot of Flynn Mark Hamill you know I saw a lot of Joel McRae that sensitivity and that vulnerability I mean, we just talked to Todd Fisher on the, the last episode, you know, and of course, we're huge Carrie Fisher fans. And to watch her do that mid-Atlantic weird accent that she mocked regularly herself as being ridiculous is very much kind of like in that Barbara Stanwyck, like trying to be very dominant type of character. And so, and I think that people tend to forget that, even though the studio system had collapsed by this point. A lot of these younger actors knew of the old stars still, you know, many still worked with Alec Guinness was a classic film performer in, in that regard, you know, working with British cinema. If you've not seen Kind Hearts and Coronets, I recommend it. He's really good in that. That's very underseen because I think now all three of them, we're looking at the next Harrison Ford, the next Mark sure. Hamill, the next Karen mm -hmm. Fisher. But they were really deferring to the old masters for their performances. There's also that like the, the correct film school terms escape me, so bear with me, but there's the presence and baggage that an actor brings when they step into another role. So when Alec Guinness is in this movie, which he himself in a personal letter to a friend, like I'm in this little science fiction thing, it's pure rubbish, it's not going to amount to anything. He brings with him Nicholson from Bridge on the River Kwai. He brings his persona. Uh, yeah, he brings that. He brings all that with Alec Guinness in a desert movie after Lawrence Arabia is like not a shock. Because of that, it, it's going to sound cliche. I'm sorry, but like it brings a level of class and you can totally see it in every frame that Mark Hamill and him that they're in that Mark Hamill admires the hell out of that guy. He can't believe he's in the same frame as Alec Guinness. You know, that's cool. And rightfully so. You know, at the time of the recording of this particular podcast with you, with the two of you, I'm just days away from having seen Singing on the Rain on the big screen because it was just on the big screen. And seeing Debbie Reynolds on the big screen, seeing Carrie Fisher, seeing her daughter, like there's just something there 
I sound like the baseball scouts from Moneyball. Like, ah, oh, you know, you know that that guy just has it, you know. But like, seriously, when you look at Carrie Fisher, she just has it. She has that commanding presence, that confidence. And as the movies go on, she had her personal challenges throughout those years of production. But you'd never know from what's on the screen because it's great, great. And what's funny too is that these classic film ties aren't limited solely to the main act. So an actor that was in the damn busters, Peter Diamond, worked on Star Wars. He played several different roles. Granted, everything in Star Wars, he's wearing a mask. I mean, he was also involved in stunt coordination, but he's the famous Tusken Raider that we see hold the gaffy stick above Luke and goes back and forth because they had a small piece of film. They didn't shoot more, and he had to rock it back and forth to get a scene out of it. He's the stormtrooper that screams the screaming Wilhelm, famous Star Wars scream, when he falls into the chasm that Luke shoots before he swings across the chasm with Leia, right? He's that guy. And who is this guy? He's in Dam Busters. He's the pilot at the controls. So he's in Dam Busters. You're like, do we have to worry about the towers? Or you got to worry about like all these lines that are also in Star Wars that they ripped from Dam Busters. Peter Diamond was sitting in a cockpit uttering some of them. So it's really cool that there's these like buried connections between these classic films and the original Star Wars. I have to, we can't not talk about the Disney of it all, because now, again, I think there's just as many people who know Star Wars as a huge series of films and ubiquitous with Disney as probably just saw the first one in isolation. And, you know, I know, Kim, you were talking about how you thought Disney ruined Star Wars. Explain yourself. This last night was the first time I had rewatched this series since episode nine. It's what, I can't even remember the title of it. Rise of Skywalker. But yeah, and it was touching on what I was saying earlier in the crafting of what has happened to the legacy now that it's everywhere. It's an amusement park and it's been, I mean, we had the, I remember the books, I, you know, Mm -hmm. but, you know, there's a TV show for everything. There's, did Boba Mm -hmm. Fett need his own TV show? Did, we're diving into so many corners now and through, I'm going to use the term that I use it through for focus group filmmaking. I mean, while Star Wars has thousands and thousands and thousands of years of history that has been mapped in books, if we're going back to, you know, the Knights of the Old Republic, I had my RPing days. I can, I have a little bit of this back in my head, <laughs> but we're just going to the common, we're revisiting, we're doing, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping Obi-Wan Kenobi is going to be great, but you know, next month we have Ewan McGregor coming back as Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney plus it hits me probably as old man screams at cloud. I remember when it was special. Like I said earlier, yeah. I remember when that was an experience and well, now they're, they're, kids have just grown up and it's everywhere. There's a couple of things with that. No, it, it kind of goes back to that cool kid bringing his son, the star Wars thing. Like I equated my fandom Someone's explaining, like, like, what do you think of all these people getting into Star Wars that don't know Star Wars? You know, which I think, like, what, what a crazy question that we live in a world that's a question. It's sort of the same with bands. You know, like, if you like a small indie band, right? So, uh, again, I'll date myself. But, like, if you became a fan of R.E.M. when the album Monster came out, the fans that had been with that band since the beginning might spit on you. Like, you know, it was, it was just kind of like, seriously, like, you're becoming a fan this, you know, like, I knew Springsteen, but like I got into Springsteen more around the Lucky Town era. And they're like, the Lucky Town era? What are you thinking? You know, so it's kind of like that with Star Wars. It's like, oh, I became a Star Wars fan during Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace? Really? And it's like, settle down. All right, there's there's room for everybody to be a fan. Okay. And I've finally accepted, like, not everything's got to be gold. One of the biggest fans I know became a Star Wars fan after the 80s TV, TV movie Caravan of Courage with the Ewoks. I'm like, you're becoming a fan because of a TV movie that was more like a members only commercial than a Star Wars movie. Like, 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 oh, okay. But like, that's how people come into the story in the franchise. I called it when Disney bought it. I said, you're going to start seeing purists and you're going to, you're going to say people like, look, one through six, Lucas had a touch with hate them, love them, whatever. He was controlling that. Now he's not right. It's in other hands and you get what you get. 
I've gone through the roller coaster of emotions with the sequels. I I I think I'm finding peace with it. I feel like I'm in, like in an AA group right now. Like you know what I'm. I got to admit, I'm enjoying watching Rise of Skywalker. Please don't hate me. You know, like it's one of those things that you like you have to kind of come to terms with. But I think it just goes back to the original blueprint of like, again, Star Wars was bigger than the two hours that were on the screen in 77. It was bigger because many, many reasons. And it was just the the catchiness of it. The fact that they didn't have toys that Christmas in 77 and Mm -hmm. kids had to get cardboard boxes saying someday we're going to ship you these action figures like seriously could you imagine pitching that like all right so how are we doing on those toys well we're not going to have them ready for christmas but we're thinking we can give them cardboard like that worked it's crazy but it worked i mean this was also the era where we were giving rocks as pets so yeah right yes (laughs) is it that far off i think one of the things that kim I don't know if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I think they're a key thing. And we've talked about this on something like double features or based on a true podcast. We've talked about the distinction in acting styles, right? Mm-hmm. Actors today are very modern in their performance. Not a lot of them are really looking at 1930s, 1940s. The films that George Lucas was citing as influences for their own performances, right? They're looking at more modern contemporary methods, mostly because that's what audiences, you know, Anything that looks like it's from the 40s feels very staid and formal and it doesn't work with our current filmmaking. So I think watching some of these movies in the Star Wars universe today, it really depends on what, and I hate to use the term auteur because that's been co-opted in such a negative way, but it really does become reliant on what the director sees as a reference. So I love Last Jedi. I know a lot of Star Wars people don't like it, but the fact that Ryan Johnson borrowed wings, the the camera shot through the casino in from the 1927 film Wings, or the fact that something like Rogue One is a heist film, and there's been a lot of comparisons to stuff like The Dirty Dozen and the other films like that. I mean, so you're really dependent on what the director feels is an influence with Star Wars these days, as opposed to having this entire body of old Hollywood filmmaking. See, I'm going to jump in there first, because to me, Star Wars has gone from, I mean, if we're using the term auteur, this was, to me, this is one of those, in Lucas's original vision, this is auteurism at where we grab for. But it is morphed to become a producer's. It's like James Bond. James Mm -hmm. Bond is not a director's franchise. It is a producer's franchise. You know, the directors really should just come and go and the elements are still there. That would be my my perspective on it, at least. Lucas, like a lot of other artists I admire, loves to lie to us. You know, he at at one point he said this was always going to be nine stories. These were going to be nine. Like I remember growing up and watching the From Star Wars the Jedi documentary on PBS whenever that was on him sitting in that couch and just like in his, in his tennis sneakers and plaid shirt saying like yeah it's nine chapters and then he gets to the prequels and then he realizes yeah i'm making the money but i'm hearing a lot of you know a lot of complaining about this story i'm telling this backstory right oh no it was always six it was always about darth vader there was never meant to be more episodes you know blah 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 you know and then we then disney gets hold of it and i'll never forget the day they announced episode seven i'm the proud father of six I have not received that many texts for any of the birth of my kids or any accomplishment my kids did as the day episode seven was announced. Oh my gosh, episode seven. Can you believe it? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm like, I just sighed. I was like, uh, okay, here we go. Yep. You know, and I loved episode seven and I enjoy the sequels. I don't want to make it sound like I'm one of those cranky old farts that can't get in with the program. But like you knew Lucas also said at one point, There should be only six films because if there's more than six, this becomes Star Trek. Okay. Those are fighting words on on like many levels between fandoms, between how you view it, between how many films there should be. You know, this is just my personal opinion. The sad thing is like, I think the Star Wars story films is a really good idea because it allowed people to play in the universe, to play in that built up world without it having to carry the weight of it's an episode. It's going to the legacy. You know, it's sort of like a spinoff of a, of a favorite TV show. You're like, okay, let's, let's just see if it can live on its own. Let's just see if it can do it. I mean, Rogue One's brilliant. Like, I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. It's a whole nother hour, you know, and you were mentioning the connections, you know, with heist films with Rogue One. Our entry this month from our guest writer is about Guns of Navarone and how much that is like 
Rogue One. You know how much Rogue One borrowed from that. There's a lot there. I'm one of the few people on the planet that can admit to liking Solo. I loved Solo. I thought it was really ballsy to make that movie. You know, I mean, really gutsy. And, it's a good and word that's for not. It. Yeah, and that's and that's not why I love it so much. Like I, I enjoyed the ride. They took some chances. I would have changed a few things if I was making that movie, but guess what? I'm not making that movie, right? It had production issues. It had all kinds of politics behind the scenes and all that, but I loved it so much. And it just suffered from being rele released too close to Last Jedi. Again, no one can wait anymore. Like, oh, oh I got to get it out there. May 25th. That's going to be so awesome. Mm, no, it's not. That's the thing is that like going back to the Star Trek Star Wars thing, like the fact that they chose to put the sequels out in the winter, in December. No, that's Star Trek territory. That's when Star Trek movies come out. Like we own May. We own the summer, you know? So it was very interesting how Disney kind of turned it sideways. And it's, I can see, I can just hear someone like listening. It's like, seriously, he cares when it was released. Yeah, I care when it was released because it's part of the film experience. Everything's part of the film experience. The Disney thing, Kimberly, to get to your thing, like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff because I was the fan in the 80s and 90s that picked up every Marvel Star Wars comic I could get my hands on. Whenever a book came out, I read it. Um, obviously, I watched the TV show. I love the animated series Droids, and I watched Ewoks because it was Star Wars, and even though I shouldn't be watching Ewoks because I was watching it, right? And then it got to a point. I remember standing. I forget. It was one of the special editions. I was standing in line for tickets, and there's a guy reading one of the billionth X-Wing books that were out. My wife's like, hey, yeah, have you read that book? And I'm like, no, I can't keep up. And it was around that time when Lucas said, like, the books don't mean anything. Watch the movies. Which I thought was like, oh, man, that's another hurtful thing you're saying to your fans. But like, it's just very, very interesting. And now, yeah, I'm keeping up with the series. But like the books, I can't, I can't. Who has, who has this much time? Like, like it's just, it's just, so, there's so much content. It's, it's just so much. And even the comics, there's so many titles to the, to this franchise right now. And they all intertwine. And I, I think that's cool. But mm, I got to pick and choose what I buy and read. I don't have that many hours in the day. I think A New Hope especially is a really good bridge. You know, we always talk about this podcast being a way for people to understand classic film, even if they don't know classic film. And I think Star Wars A New Hope is a really good bridge because it started in isolation is one thing. And it has now blossomed into this huge franchise. And ironically, one of the things that I know people like about classic film is how self-contained everything was. There wasn't intellectual IP. You know, yes, there were remakes, but everything felt very much in isolation. You had big franchises like James Bond, but even something like The Thin Mans or, you know, the Maisie series, anything like that that had sequels didn't feel like a franchise in the sense that we now know and see it today. So I think that Star Wars really is that bridge between classic filmdom and modern filmmaking for good and bad. It shows where we progressed and it shows why we love going back to a simpler era. Like, it's funny because I, I think it was um, Wired Magazine and they did a timeline map of the industry pre-Star Wars and then how it exploded after it. People that went on to direct Marvel movies and all the other movies that are out now that are, regardless of how you feel about that in the industry, like that's where the industry's at. It's interesting because when I started the blog, and I started talking about these old movies with fellow Star Wars fans, I was shocked by the resistance for them to watch the older movies. There was just kind of like, well, why would I want to, like, why would I want to watch Metropolis? Because that's where C-3PO comes from. Like, that's why you want to watch it. Besides, it's a freaking great movie. Like, you should see this movie. You know, but there was this interesting, pardon the pun, resistance to wanting to see these classic movies. And that just inspired me even more. I was like, no, 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 that's why I need to do this blog. That's why I need to write this thing. You know, and a few years after it, StarWars.com did a similar type of blog story called The Cinema Behind Star Wars. And, you know, we covered a lot of the same titles. And the person that wrote some of that, like, I was part of my Facebook group with associated with the blog. So, like, great. But that didn't last long on StarWars.com because I think for the most part, Star Wars fans, they just want to talk about Star Wars and slash modern movies. But when you do get people that really are fascinated by where it came from, and when they start hearing these things, like it only takes one really good classic movie that's referenced in, in any of the Star Wars pieces, not just A New Hope, where you're like, oh my gosh, like Lucas really knows his stuff. Like he, he, he stole from good source material, you know? And that's what you got to do as an artist. If you're going to steal, make sure it's good. He did that. He did that quite well. Yes, I'm a, I'm a George Lucas fan, but like uh, I'm going to say, like he's sort of like Picasso. Picasso was able to take a lot of various elements and what was 
going on in the field, what he wanted to do, scraps of newspaper, various media, and combine it and make something fresh, new, and exciting. And people couldn't wait for the next thing. And Lucas had achieved that after American Graffiti. Once he proved, once he dispelled the myths of filmmaking with American Graffiti, like, hey, you can have three-minute scenes, and you can have a soundtrack that has 50 tracks on it. Once he broke that mold, he, he was able to do like, okay, I'm going to do all this other stuff. Now, people could say like, yeah, but like, what did the other stuff amount to outside of Star Wars and Indiana Jones? Well, that's debatable, but you can't ignore what Star Wars did for the industry. And I get it. It's funny. I, I mentioned that Star Wars films resistant to classic films. For crying out loud, our, our beloved Ben Mankiewicz is kind of like, eh, I don't want to talk about Star Wars. I wasn't excited about it. And I get it. I get it because to your point, Kristen, like we all know it and we've heard about it for now 45 years. And some people have made up their minds and I've encountered these people in my life and I'm still surprised they exist. We're like, I, I am not going to watch Star Wars. Like they make the conscious decision not to watch a movie. I've heard too much about it. I don't want to see it. I'm hoping that that changes. I'm hoping that people understand like in its context, in its historical context of what it, when it came out in America, when it came out worldwide, where we were at that time, as well as the progression of film, that it's, it's an important one to see. I was reading some reviews for from the original run right before this because I just wanted to see how it was perceived. And the resistance is it's because and we've also seen 1977 trotted out so often as that's kind of the dividing line almost. People mm -hmm. go to cinema started at 1977 with Star Wars, you know, things changed. Reading the reviews, that was interesting to see because, I mean, there were very few negative ones that I saw, but the negative ones were coming from the old guard of reviewers, the Pauline Kales, you know, that is the name that comes to mind. And the negative reviews were hitting it on the things that we still hit on cinema now, the IP, the dumbing down of you know, cinema being childish, things like, it's the same arguments that we hear trotted out with Marvel movies. Mm -hmm. And Star Wars has come to be a symbol of where cinema went, it, where cinema mm -hmm. shifted to, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see that dispelled. I can see where people would have the hesitation, but as, I mean, as someone who loves it, I mean, this has been a great discussion here this last hour, just to remind us that art doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not mm -hmm. purely, it has influences. It's completely rooted in classic cinema. Mm -hmm. And this didn't just appear. George Lucas had plans and ideas and he had influences and he was doing his thing and he revolutionized cinema when he did it. The most recent quote from Lucas that people hang on in regards to Star Wars, what it's become, was something he was touting a lot with episode one before that came out. It was that like, you know, it was really a movie for nine-year-old boys. You know, it's always been a movie for nine-year-old boys. And again, like a lot of great artists, he loves to say one thing one year and lie another. But one of the interesting things in that, you know, as I was going through my notes, getting ready for this podcast is that. In his production notes, he had a quote from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in his production notes as a reminder to himself. And basically, is like the, the quote is, I have wrought my simple plan. If I give one hour of joy to the boy who's half a man or the man who's half a boy. And that right there said like he was trying to hit multiple levels of audience members and something that would speak to them. And in doing that, he created something that like a good classic film will stand the test of time. When you watch Casablanca, you're in it. You're all in it and you love it and you realize you're going to exit it. And it's the same thing with Star Wars. You know, a lot of the guests that I had on my blog has said like they all had the, the most common theme amongst the guests when they write was that when they share their first Star Wars experience was how disappointed they were when they walked out of the movie theater and the real world existed. And what's interesting is when you think about it, pre-Star Wars, Every single film took place on Earth or had a tie to Earth. Star Wars has no tie to planet Earth whatsoever. And that's really a crazy radical concept. And now that that is another mold that's been broken, we can accept movies like, okay, this is going to take place in fairyland and we don't need a human counterpart from Earth to get us there. We're just in. And that's the magic of this particular movie. This specifically, New Hope, is that it started that. That's a note to go out on. Chris? We thank you for sitting down and sharing your expertise with us and putting up with my lack of Star Wars knowledge. 
where can fans find you on social media? What do you have coming up on your blog? Feel free to share. Oh, thank you. Before I start plugging stuff, I want to thank the two of you for having me on this podcast. Having listened to episodes of Ticklish Business, I'm like, I don't know if I can hang with these ladies. I hope I'm intelligent enough to contribute to this conversation. So I am really honored <laughs> that you asked. So, so thank you so much. My blog is called Digging Star Wars, and you can find it at diggingstarwars.blogspot.com. So that's all one word, diggingstarwars.blogspot.com. I am on Letterboxd. You can either search by my name, Chris Mitch, or you can just search by Digging Star Wars. Again, just make it all one word, no spaces between the letters. I'm on Instagram as Digging Star Wars, and I have a Digging Star Wars group on Facebook. You can just type in Digging Star Wars, and if you want to join, let me know. And I am on Twitter at, at Chris Mitch one the number one so you know i go on to twitter for two reasons well I'll, I'll say three reasons i'm a huge henry mancini fan so i go on and, and talk about my henry mancini stuff but in addition to that it's either star wars or classic film that's why i'm on there so uh, let me know if you have something interesting on there as well i'd love to, to hear from you well we hope you enjoyed this episode if there's something about star wars that we didn't talk about your love of darth vader the weird incesty relationship that develops between luke and leia you can email it to us at tiflyfizz at gmail.com. You can send us a tweet at ticklish underscore biz or head over to our Instagram at ticklish biz and let us know your thoughts. We are wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify, Stitcher, Radio Player FM, and Apple Podcasts. Please leave us a review. They do help us out. No less than five stars will do. We also have a TikTok, ticklish biz. So Kim is posting some great videos special promos, letting people know what we have coming up. Please head over there and follow us if you aren't already. Oh, also, if you want to help us out with your money, we have a Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz where we do all sorts of other episodes, including double features and based on a true podcast. We are going to be embarking on an ambitious series looking at the different versions of Elvis biopics in anticipation of Boz Lerman's new film on the singer and actor. So you are definitely going to want to listen and subscribe to that. It's a patreon.com slash ticklish biz. We also give away DVDs and Blu-rays throughout the year, pins, all sorts of fun stuff. It is a great community. So please help us out. If we get to hundred subscribers, I will tell everybody why Love Story is the worst classic film of all time. You want to hear that because I have a lot of thoughts and they've been bubbling for several months. So head over there. We will be back with a new episode till then.